Welcome to another great edition of Excited About the Gospel. I am Jason Harwood, your lifelong seminary teacher. You remember when you were in seminary and learning about the gospel was kind of fun and exciting? That's what this podcast is all about. And we have a great, great topic this week. My goodness, we have some great stuff from Come Follow Me this week. We're in Alma uh, 39 through 42, where Alma really does some uh, some of the most powerful teaching anywhere in scripture. Chapter 39 is kind of a fun one. It's one chapter for, uh, well, 38 is one chapter for Shiblon. 39, he starts talking to his son, Corianton. And in 40, he asks an important question. He says, uh, now concerning the state of the soul between death and the resurrection, what happens to us after we die and before we're resurrected? He talks about that. In Alma chapter 42, he gives a great sermon on justice and mercy. And there is a really great old seminary video called um, The Mediator from Boyd K. Packer. And that is in the content for Come Follow Me this week. Go watch it. Watch it with your kids. Talk about justice and mercy. It's really great. But there's one verse in these that as soon as I saw what we were covering this week, I was like, okay, that's going to be our topic for the week on Excited About the Gospel because it's something that's so important, so exciting, and quite relevant for all of us. And that's Alma 41.10. Do not suppose because it has been spoken concerning restoration. See, he's talking to Coriantum. And Coriantum doesn't really understand the connection between life and death and restoration and the resurrection. And he kind of um, doesn't quite understand all of this stuff. And so that's what Alma is talking to him about is the connection between our life now and uh, post-mortal life, etc. He says, don't be cons- or, or, or don't get it confused because we've talked about being restored that you're going to be restored from sin to happiness that's not going to happen that's one of the misconceptions nephi talked about it in second nephi when he says that many people will say ah eat and drink and be merry tomorrow we die sin a little and if it so be that we're guilty god's going to beat us with a few stripes and in the end we'll be saved we're going to be restored from sin to happiness Alma says, no, that's not the case. This time, this life is the day for men to prepare to meet God. Behold, the day of this life is the time for men to perform their labors. After the day of this life, there's no more labor to perform. And so we have to focus in on the behavior now. It really matters. And it's not true that we're going to die and just, yeah, eventually everybody will make it to the celestial kingdom because we'll be restored from sin to happiness. That's not the case. As Alma says in this next powerful one-line sentence, Behold, I say unto you, wickedness never was happiness. I think there's an important line in there when he says, don't, don't think you're going to be restored from sin to happiness. Those two opposites that he uses, why does he use those two words as opposite ends of the spectrum? Because sin is the opposite end of happiness. Don't think you're going to go from wickedness to happiness from sin to happiness. Wickedness never was happiness. He didn't say from sin to cleanliness. He didn't say from sin to exaltation. He didn't say from sin to salvation. He says from sin to happiness. I think that's very interesting, which leads us to a really important question for our day. This is where we get excited. This is where we're like, okay, Alma, if I'm not going to be restored from wickedness to, uh, uh, from sin to happiness, because wickedness never was happiness, What is happiness? Where do I find happiness? That's what we're going to talk about this week, because we should be able to utilize the scriptures and identify, okay, where can I find happiness? Let's start with one of my favorite places to look at on this topic, which is 2 Nephi chapter 5. In 2 Nephi chapter 5, Nephi starts off, they've made it to America, uh, to the promised land, and they are living, Nephites, Lamanites, everybody all together. And in chapter 5, 2 Nephi chapter 5, Nephi is praying because of the anger of my brethren. Their anger did increase against me in so much that they did seek to take away my life. Laman and Lemuel, they haven't changed much since 1 Nephi chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They're still playing the let's kill Nephi game. And Nephi is praying, saying, what do I do? And in verse 5, the Lord did warn me that I, Nephi, should depart from them and flee into the wilderness and all those who would go with me. So, boom, Nephi goes. Bad time. Not a great 
time for Nephi. I mean, he has to separate himself from part of his family because they keep trying to kill him. But by 2 Nephi 5 verse 27, we get this great, great line. He says, came to pass that we lived after the manner of happiness. We lived after the manner of happiness. Wickedness never was happiness, but there is a manner of happiness. Nephi outlines it for us in 2 Nephi chapter 5. What is the manner of happiness? We can look through a bunch of verses here and identify what is it that the Nephites were doing that despite the fact that bad things were surrounding them, difficult, challenging <laughs> life stuff, family stuff, not good stuff, they lived after the manner of happiness. What do we learn? Let's start with 2 Nephi 5, verse 6. came to pass that I Nephi to take my family, Zoram and his family, Sam, my elder brother, and his family, J Jacob and Joseph, my younger brethren, and also my sisters, and all those who would go with me. That's the first clue, is family. Happiness and families are often tied together. I know this is not true for everybody, and some people think, man, my family is not very happy, but... I'm just looking at what Nephi did as a model of happiness. We all have to apply it to our own personal circumstances. But when we start talking about happiness, we start and we say, okay, I got to be surrounded by people who love me. I got to be surrounded by people who lift me up, who are there to support me, who are there to be by my side. You see that from Zoram and um, Jacob, Joseph, Sam. We hope it's from your family. And we find great joy and happiness in our families. But surround yourself with people who help lift you up. That's one of the ways to find happiness. He goes on, verse 10. We did observe to keep the judgments and the statutes and the commandments of the Lord in all things according to the law of Moses. If wickedness never was happiness, then righteousness and keeping the commandments is happiness. A great quote from Marlon K. Jensen in a talk called Living After the Manner of Happiness. Elder Jensen was a member of the presidency of the 70. He says, here's a simple but powerful truth. Living righteously, keeping God's commandments makes us happy. Makes me think of Mosiah chapter 2, verse 41, one of my favorite scriptures anywhere in scripture. Mosiah 2, 41, moreover, I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state of those who keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they're received into heaven. Keeping the commandments is one of the key components of happiness. He, Marlon K. Jensen, in, in that talk, he then quoted Alma 41.10, wickedness never was happiness. And he says, as best as I can tell, based on my own experience and my observations of others, Alma's is as categorical a statement as can be made on the subject. And our chances of proving Alma wrong are about zero. For those who continue to try to find happiness in wickedness, chances of that are about zero. Back to now, uh, Second Nephi chapter 5, some other things that they do. Um, verse 12, I, Nephi, also brought the records which are engraven upon the plates of brass. They've got the scriptures. Scriptures are tied to happiness. He takes the sword of Laban, and uh, they make swords, and they prepare. It's an interesting thing. Living after the manner of happiness includes work. It includes preparation. He talks about them farming and raising herds. That's part of living after the manner of happiness is being anxiously engaged in a good cause and doing many things of our own free will, bringing to pass much righteousness. That's part of happiness. Second Nephi 5, 16, I, Nephi, did build a temple and I did construct it after the manner of the temple of Solomon. Temples are a part of living after the manner of happiness, living this life of positive, happy state. Part of that is the temple. Aren't we so grateful that we have temples today? Verse 26, came to pass that I, Nephi, did consecrate Jacob and Joseph, that they should be priests and teachers over the land of my people. This concept of church service, part of what Nephi did in building a pattern of happiness. So you read 2 Nephi 5 and you see patterns of behavior that lead to happiness. Families, obedience, keeping the commandments, working hard, 
temple attendance, service in the church. Uh, what did I leave out? The scriptures, maybe. Uh, these are the manner of happiness. These are the patterns of life that continuously build up to bring us happiness. Wickedness never was happiness. Second Nephi 5 is the pattern for happiness. Happiness is an interesting thing because when we think about it, we, we start kind of getting philosophical here. And we think, well, what is happiness? What, what are we talking about here? What, what does it mean to be happy? And um, for the most part, happiness is a matter of contentment. It, 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 happiness is sort of the gap between what we wish things were and what things are. When we find ourselves discontented, it's often a gap between what we wish life would be and what life really is. This doesn't mean necessarily that life is always perfect, that life is always fantastic, that there's never any trials or struggles. Um, I want to read a little bit from a 2016 talk from President Nelson. Let's get some modern pattern of happiness. We just looked at Nephi giving us his pattern of happiness. Let's look at President Nelson talking about this because he's going to talk to us about some powerful concepts around happiness. He says this, this is from a talk, Joy and Spiritual Survival, October 2016, President Russell M. Nelson. Life is filled with detours and dead ends, trials and challenges of every kind. Each of us has likely had times when distress, anguish, and despair almost consumed us. Yet, we are here to have joy? He puts that in a question mark. We're here to have joy? Should we pause there? Let, let's pause there. Let's go look at that verse. 2 Nephi 2.25. Adam felt that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. Wait, we're supposed to have joy? Adam felt the men might be, Adam and they might have joy? We're going to come back to 2 Nephi 2.25, but let's get back to President Nelson. Yes, exclamation point. The answer is a resounding yes, exclamation point. I'm not overemphasizing that. He puts those two exclamation points in there. But how is that possible? That's the question. How is it possible? And then in his talk... He uh, gives us some answers. Let's see what he has to say. And then we're going to come back to 2 Nephi 2.25 because 2 Nephi 2.25 actually tells us the answer of uh, how we find happiness and joy. He says, President Nelson again, joined Spiritual Survival, October 2016. Saints can be happy under every circumstance. We can feel joy even while having a bad day, a bad week, or even a bad year. My dear brothers and sisters, the joy we feel has little to do with our circumstance, with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. Ooh, I have to read that line again. It's so good. Plus, I flubbed it a little bit. So we're going to read it again. The joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. That's good stuff. When the focus of our lives is on God's plan of salvation, which President Thomas S. Monson has taught us, and Jesus Christ and his gospel, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our life. Joy comes from and because of him. He is the source of all joy. We feel it at Christmas time when we sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. And we feel it all year round for Latter-day Saints. Jesus Christ is joy. Let's pause there from President Nelson and let's go back to 2 Nephi 2.25. Is this an echo of something that's been taught to us before? Are we hearing echoes of what Lehi was teaching to his children uh, 600 plus 2,000, 2,600 years ago? <sighs> this might be. Adam felt that, they, that men might be and men are that they might have joy. Listen to the next line that, Nephi, or that Lehi says in 2 Nephi 2.26. The Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because they're redeemed from the fall, they've become free forever. You see, Adam felt that men might be, and the next line is Jesus. Jesus is the source of joy. President Nelson, joy comes from and because of him, Jesus Christ is joy, joy to the world, the Lord is come. 
Jesus, we find peace in Christ. We find joy in Christ. We find uh, rest in Christ. So many of the things we're looking for come from the Savior. Now, verse 27, wherefore men are free according to the flesh and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. They're free to choose liberty and eternal life or to choose captivity and death. You see, so what brings us joy? It is not the circumstances of our lives. The joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. When our focus is on Christ and on eternal perspective. Let's now go to uh, a great quote. This is from Neil A. Maxwell in a talk called Plow in Hope. Neil A. Maxwell, boy, he was tough to understand sometimes. Sometimes you had to listen to him two or three times. I remember watching him as a kid, never understanding a single word that guy said. I remember reading him as a teenager and as a 20-something-year-old. And when I read him, I really understood. When I listened, it was much more difficult for me to quite comprehend what he was saying. But as soon as I started reading, I, so let me, let me go through something that he says here. This is Neil A. Maxwell, Plow and Hope. He says, enduring and submitting are not passive responses at all but instead are actually more like being braced sufficiently to report for advanced duties while carrying meekly and victoriously bruises from the previous phrase. What did he <laughs> say? He says that this concept of enduring and submitting, it, we, these are active behaviors that we do. What are a few fingers of scorn now anyway? He's referencing 1 Nephi 8.33 when people pointed the finger of scorn to those that were in the uh, eating at the tree. What are a few fingers of scorn anyway when the faithful can eventually know what it is like to be clasped in the arms of Jesus? What are mocking words now if later we hear these glorious words? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Meanwhile, Paul urges us to plow in hope. That's in 1 Corinthians 9.10. Therefore, desperately needed is longitudinal perspective, the hope of the gospel. Today's put down is then placed in the perspective of our being lifted up tomorrow in God's plan of happiness. Since the Lord wants a people tried in all things, how specifically will we be tried? He tells us, I will try the faith and the patience of my people. Since faith in the timing of the Lord may be tried, let us learn to say not only thy will be done, but patiently also thy timing be done. Let's see if we can put all these things together and try to understand them. Basically, what Elder Maxwell is saying is what is desperately needed is longitudinal perspective, not getting caught up in mocking words now, scornful fingers now. We got to get caught up in the long-term hope of the gospel, the long-term perspective, not the put-downs now, but the being lifted up tomorrow, not the mocking words now, but the glorious words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, later, not the finger of scorn now, but the clasped in the arms of Jesus, not some of the pain, trial, difficulty, and struggle that we go through now, the hope of the gospel, the joy of the gospel, the peace in Christ, men are that they might have joy through the Messiah, through the mediator. Same thing as what President Nelson taught. And that's what Alma was trying to teach Corianton way back where we started at in Alma chapter 40, uh, well, 39, 40, 41, 42. See, Coriantumer, Corianton, uh, Coriantumer was caught up, Corianton? I'll make sure I'm saying the right name here. There's uh, uh, Corianton. Corianton, Corianton is another military leader. Corianton was caught up in the here and now. He was making decisions now uh, that were not leading to long-term happiness, long-term joy, uh, focusing in, in on the here and now. And that's what Elder Maxwell, President Nelson, Alma, uh, Nephi, Lehi, they're all saying we can find joy and happiness now in Christ. And part of that is because of the hope of the gospel, plow in hope of what's to come. N not just here and now, but in the eternities. Sometimes we have to go through some stuff here and now to be ready for what's going to come 
in the eternities. And it's interesting because I think about this in my own life. And I think about some of the joy I'm experiencing now. And I think I couldn't experience the joy that I'm feeling now if it wasn't for some of the pain, things I didn't want to go through. But having gone through them is sort of the only way to get to the place where I can now experience the joy that that I do have. Let's go back to President Nelson, shall we? October 2016, joy and spiritual survival. Joy is powerful, and focusing on joy brings God's power into our lives. As in all things, Jesus Christ is our ultimate exemplar, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Think of that. President Nelson says, in order for him to endure the most excruciating experience ever endured on earth, our Savior focused on joy. And what was the joy that was set before him? Surely it included the joy of cleansing, healing, and strengthening us, the joy of praying for the sins of all who would repent, the joy of making it possible for you and me to return home clean and worthy to live with our heavenly parents and families. If we focus on the joy that will come to us or to those we love, we can endure that what, what can we endure that presently seems overwhelming, painful, scary, unfair, or simply impossible. Let me say that again, because I flubbed it. If we focus on the joy that will come to us or to those we love, what can we endure that presently seems overwhelming, painful, scary, unfair, or simply impossible? There you go. And And then President Nelson wraps up here with a modern wording recap of what Alan was trying to teach Corey and Tim then. If we look to the world and follow its formula for happiness, we'll never know joy. The unrighteous may experience any number of emotions and sensations, but they will never experience joy. Joy is a gift for the faithful. It is the gift that comes from intentionally trying to live a righteous life as taught by Jesus Christ. He taught us how to have joy. When we choose Heavenly Father to be our God, and when we feel the Savior's atonement working in our lives, we'll be filled with joy. Every time we nurture our spouse and guide our children, every time we forgive someone or ask for forgiveness, we can feel joy. Every time that you and I choose to live celestial laws, every day that we keep our covenants and uh, help others do the same, joy will be ours. Great, great counsel there from President Nelson. Let's look at just a a couple more scriptures. We haven't looked at the Bible yet. So let's look at a couple uh, Bible verses um, that teach us a a couple more things here about joy as we wrap up. We'll start in Psalms. Psalms 1611 teaches us an interesting uh, principle here. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Now, we can look at that and we can think, oh, that's a reference to dying. That's a reference to saying, when I die and I'm in the presence of God and I'm at his right hand, then I'll be happy. You could choose to look at it that way. I also choose to expand my personal interpretation and application of that verse to say that it's an invitation for us now to find out how do I get into the presence of God now? I don't want to wait for fullness of joy. I don't want to wait to be in the presence of God. I don't want to wait to experience some of the joy that God has for me now because I'm expecting to, you know, live it or get it later. I want it now, a bit selfish and a bit um, living in our now society, but I believe that's there for us. I believe we can have it now. The question is, how do I how do I put myself in the presence of God? How do I find ways to get in His presence and to feel that joy? Because if I go back to what President Nelson says, President Nelson says we can have that joy now. He says uh, when we choose Heavenly Father to be our God, when we 
can feel the Savior's atonement working in our lives, we'll be filled with joy. Every time we nurture our spouse or guide our children, every time we forgive someone or ask forgiveness, we can feel joy. Every day that you and I choose to live celestial laws, every day that we keep our covenants and help others to do the same, joy will be ours. It can be a now experience if we choose to let it be. Uh, And that's the invitation, is to proactively find a way to get into the presence of God now. We've talked a little bit about how to do that. Why was, look back, think back to the, the pattern that Nephi taught us about scripture study, about being with family, about temples, about service, about work. Many of those things are the things that bring us into the presence of God. He gives us some more clues here. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That's a now invitation. That's a, that's a current and present life situation. That's saying, come unto me now, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest, and you can find rest unto your souls. Um, we're, we're encouraged to do that now. And, and I think that's part of... What we learn is that that we don't have to put off happiness. We don't have to put off joy. We don't have to struggle through life hoping that the only time we'll find joy is, you know, after we die and after we're in the presence of God. No, life should be joyful as we find joy in Christ. One last verse, a set of verses here. Let's go to John 15. And the verse that kind of stands out here is 11. These things I have spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. We might just read that verse by itself and that's great. But boy, if you pick up and go from 10 through 13, increases the meaning drastically. Now, look how exciting this is. He says, well, let's pick it up at nine. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We have the same access and potential to God's love through keeping the commandments that Jesus had. These things I have spoken that my joy might remain in you, that your joy may be full. When we keep the commandments, we have God's love in us. And when we have God's love in us, we feel joy. This is my commandment. He said, this is the commandment that's going to bring love into your heart, love into your life, love into your existence, into your being the way that Jesus had love and the joy that Jesus felt, that your joy may be full, that your that, that my joy might remain in you. This is the commandment. What's the commandment that's going to bring that to us? That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the joy. That is wickedness never was happiness. That is, you're not going to be restored from sin to happiness. That is, Adam felt that men might be in men or that they might have joy. That teaches us in as plain and simple terms as possible how we do it. Jesus says, I love you the way the Father loved me. I got that love from the Father in me because I kept the commandments. You can keep the commandments. When you keep the commandments, you'll have my love in you, my Joy will remain with you. Your joy will be full. And this is the commandment. Love others as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Uh, We can feel the love of God in our life. And we feel it most poignantly when we love others, when we show that love to others. I'll, I'll just go back here real quick to what President Nelson says. When we feel the Savior's atonement working in our lives, we'll be filled with joy. Every time we nurture our spouse and guide our children, love others. Every time we forgive someone or ask for forgiveness, we can feel joy. That the, we're learning the same thing. Learning the exact same thing. From President Nelson today is what Jesus taught in John 15, uh, 2,000 years ago. The simple question is, Can we have the longitudinal perspective, the focus? 
It's not about the circumstances of our lives. It's about the focus of our life. When the focus of our life is the Savior, loving the Savior, and serving our fellow men, then we feel joy. That's pretty exciting because I can do that. I can have that in my life. I can get that. I have that opportunity. I hope you feel that excitement in your life. I hope you're thinking, yeah, let's do it. Let's go do some service. Let's go do some love. Let's go love some people and get God's love in my heart, God's joy in my heart, God's peace in my heart through Christ. And let's go make it happen this week. That's pretty exciting. Thank you for participating and excited about the gospel. Can't wait to see you on the next episode.